today we're talking about St. John Bosco. St. John Bosco is a super cool saint, one of my favorite saints. They're all favorites, but he's a favorite. Um, my first encounter with him was when I was in college, my freshman year of college. I had a friend who, oh, she loved St. John Bosco more than any other saint. His feast day is on January 31st, so our freshman year of college, she decided to throw a Bosco bash. It was a huge party in honor of St. John Bosco. And one of the things that St. John Bosco is known for is the fact that he could juggle, and he taught himself how to juggle. And so she taught herself how to juggle along with another friend of ours, and then they had this really cool juggling party in honor of St. John Bosco, our freshman year of college. So that was my first, I knew about him, but that was my first exposure to St. John Bosco. So who is this juggling saint? Um, he was born in Northern Italy in 1815. Now this is a period of time where things were really challenging for the entire world because the entire world from 1815, well, from the 1850s onward, it starts to undergo something called the Industrial Revolution. You may have learned about this in your history classes already, but if you haven't, you'll learn about it in the future. And what happened was is that there was a transition from a farming community to a more industrialized city type community. And so you had people flocking to cities by the thousands in only a couple of years, which meant that so many people were thrown into poverty. There were slums in all of the cities, and this was happening all over the world, in the United States, all over Europe and Asia. So the Industrial Revolution really changed how people related to each other and how families related to each other because both mothers and fathers were now working crazy long hours. It was often an 80-hour work week and not a 40-hour work week. Kids were expected to work, and if you couldn't work, then you didn't have food, you couldn't afford a house, everybody was dirt poor. And so this was the period of time that St. John Bosco grew up in. Uh, he grew up as the son of a farmer, and he had two older brothers. When he was two years old, his father passed away. And that meant that he and his two older brothers were responsible for taking care of their mother. She was a good and holy woman who hugely influenced St. John Bosco's life. So he had a dream when he was a kid of this really beautifully, nobly dressed man appearing to him in front of a whole bunch of boys that were arguing and fighting and um, they blaspheming God, like saying all sorts of crazy things and doing crazy things to each other. And there was this huge fight with all these boys going on in front of him and John Bosco was standing back with this man. And this man said, you need to win these boys over with love and with patience, not with violence and punishment. And you need to start showing them that sin is ugly and virtue is beautiful. So that dream stayed with St. John Bosco his entire life. From that point on, um, he tried to become educated. He tried to go to school, but schools were expensive. They weren't free. And his oldest brother said, you know what? We're farmers. You can't get educated. What's the point? Like, okay, maybe you can learn how to read. You don't need to know how to do anything else. We're going to be farmers our whole lives. You're just a farmer. You're not going to be anything else. But St. John Bosco... Um, he had a lot of different likes and interests that weren't typical. He enjoyed watching traveling performers and circus people. So he would go and see the traveling for performers when they came into town. And after watching them, he learned how to do magic tricks and how to juggle. And he used to have like little shows for his friends. Um, he also wanted to go to school. He had an in his mind that he wanted to be a priest when he grew up. And at this time, the priest was a higher class. It wasn't a group, it wasn't a occupation or a vocation that, you know, poor people chose. You couldn't become a priest if you were too poor. And I mean, it didn't happen, but it wasn't very common at this time. So the fact that John Bosco wanted to even be a priest was already shooting for the moon. Anyway, at 12 years old, 
his family life gets very challenging for him, especially because of his older brothers, and he actually runs away from home. You know, he's a pretty good kid, and he's very virtuous, but he ran away from home. And from there, he starts begging for work and begging for food and begging for a place to stay. And this really influences him when he starts looking at boys when he becomes an adult. He starts seeing all of these homeless boys everywhere. And that really changes his own experience, changes how he relates to them. So during this time, he tries to study on his own. His mother kind of taught him how to read and he learned some basic educational things when he was a child. But when he ran away from, went, ran away from home, he really tried to teach himself, but he was running into all sorts of problems because if you're poor, you don't have resources to teach yourself. And so he finally meets this priest who really takes an interest in him and befriends him and then pays for his education. This priest that took an interest in him is actually a saint, Saint Joseph Cafasso. And so Saint John Bosco is influenced directly by another saint. And by the way, Saint John Bosco's mother, she was a powerhouse of a woman and her cause for canonization is also in the Vatican so she might be a saint someday too so holy people travel together in packs anyway so um, Joseph Cafaso really takes an interest in John Bosco and pays for his education and sends him off to seminary because John Bosco wanted to be a priest so at the end of six years of studying John Bosco graduates and at first he's sent off to this girls school but then he starts noticing these poor boys all over the town that are just kind of hiding in the dark alleyways and the dark corners of the city. And he's really moved by them because he's had an experience of being poor and he knows what it's like to struggle with poverty. So he starts trying to reach out to these boys. Um, he also starts visiting prisons and notices that so many of the people in the prisons at this time are boys from the ages of 12 to 18. Why is a 12 year old in prison? That's what John Bosco was asking himself. And so he started thinking to himself, there has to be a way to help these boys. So he actually starts going into the slums himself, these slum areas where the boys were, they didn't have homes, they didn't have food, they were sleeping on the streets, they didn't have work. And they weren't educated so they were basically traveling around in gangs getting themselves into all sorts of trouble by this point his mom is actually also living with him and so he starts trying to help whoever he can help he starts inviting the boys to come and live with him and he you know finds a boy here finds a boy there and he invites them he gives them a warm meal gives them a bed to sleep in and he actually got them to pay attention to him by walking up to them and asking them questions like, hey, do you go to mass? No, we don't go to church. He's like, well, do you have a mother and father? No, we don't have parents. Well, can you whistle? Wait, what, whistle? Yeah, I can whistle. And then all of a sudden friendships are born because he wants to talk to them about whistling. Or he would throw juggling shows or magic shows. And he would just invite all these poor kids from all over the region to come and watch him juggle. And so he was known for being friendly, for being open. And so he got a lot of boys to come and stay with him and, it, like, and pretty soon he outgrew his house. Now this wasn't without problems because a lot of the boys, they would come and stay one night and they would steal stuff from his house and then leave. But that didn't stop him from trying to help these boys. He just realized how broken they were and how much help they needed. He tries to start a community lifestyle for these boys. He has enough of them that are willing to listen to him and are willing to live together that he tries to purchase a little piece of property and a little house so that they can all live together there. And he calls it the oratory, which is kind of like the word for a prayer house, but he calls it the oratory. And he started there with 36 boys. By the end of his life, he was ministering to thousands of boys at one time. And the oratory, the original oratory he started, went from 36 boys to 800. Now, you would think that you have this awesome guy, this awesome priest who's willing to help these poor boys. The townspeople, the government, the church must have loved him, right? 
Not at all. Not at all. The townspeople hated what he was doing because if you think about it, he's gathering all this riffraff and he's putting them all together in one place. Who knows what trouble they're going to get into? And they're so noisy. The townspeople hated it. The boys were too noisy. They were too disruptive. They were going to break everything. So the townspeople hated John Bosco. The government hated him too because they were suspicious. They actually, the government at this time was anti-Catholic in Italy and they thought that he was training revolutionaries and they were going to overthrow the government. So he was even being suppressed by the government and you would at least think that his fellow priests and bishops would like what he's doing. No, because he was stealing their parishioners. So nobody liked what St. John Bosco was doing, even though he was helping hundreds, thousands of these boys get off the street, giving them a warm meal, giving them a good education, and training them in a trade. He trained them, um, got them apprenticeships at different jobs so that they could learn a trade rather than running around and growing up and not having a real job or being able to support themselves. So... He was fought on all sides, even though he knew for sure that he was doing God's will. So he did have some supporters, and he realized with the help of these supporters that just being a regular priest wasn't going to cut it. He needed to start a religious community to give this structure and to give this organization instead of him just being a parish priest doing his own thing. So he decides to found a religious community called the Salesians of Saint or the Salesians of Don Bosco. And Don in Italian means father. So the Salesians of Father Bosco. And the Salesians are named after another saint, St. Francis de Sales. He lived in the 1600s, and he was known for having a very ordinary holiness and helping everyday people like you and me become saints. And so St. John Bosco really loved St. Francis de Sales and named his religious community after St. Francis de Sales. What's interesting about the Salesians is that who did John Bosco get to help him start this religious community? some of the boys who had grown up and become priests themselves. There were so many boys that he influenced that grew up to become priests and monks and cardinals and bishops, and some of them are even saints. Like There are two very famous saints that are connected with him, Saint Dominic Savio, who is one of the youngest saints in the Catholic Church. And then there's another saint, Blessed Michele Rua, who was a boy that John Bosco mentored, who grew up, became a priest, and then actually was John Bosco's successor when he died. So he founded this community with boys that he actually trained himself. Uh, John Bosco firmly believed that the boys shouldn't be violently punished. It was very common at this time that if you screwed up, you would get beaten, you would get your hand smacked with a ruler, you would get taken outside and use like different types of a corporal punishment. John Bosco didn't believe in any of this. He believed in love and patience. And so he never punished the boys. He would correct them. He would let them know that what they were doing was wrong. And he would try and stop them from doing bad things. But he would always sit them down and explain with love and with patience, this is wrong and you can't do it. And there were measures where, you know, there were punishments, but they weren't the bodily punishments that most of the society was using at the time. So that made his method very successful. A lot of the boys really responded to his love and his patience and the fact that he was so happy all the time. And he made, he kept saying, holiness is easy. Being a saint is easy. And so he made holiness look happy and joyful and easy. And that really drew a lot of people to him. And his order grew like crazy to the point that by the end of his life, he was getting requests from all over the world to come and start schools in these different countries from South America, North America, Asia, Africa, all over the world. They were asking the Salesians to come and start religious communities and to start schools for their poor children. So at the end of his life, he died on January 31st, 1988. And that's actually his feast day, January 31st. And 
thousands of people came to his funeral. That's how popular he was and that's how well-loved he was. People started right away petitioning Rome and the Vatican to get him canonized as a saint, and he was canonized in 1934. And so the Salesians are still around today. They're a huge religious community, especially in third world countries and countries where education is difficult for poor populations. So a lot of Asian countries, Africa, South America, poor countries. Uh, they are There are some Salesians in the United States. They're not as popular, but they are here. So that's the legacy of St. John Bosco. So to wrap this up, I actually want you to think about, uh, I find this fascinating, the fact that saints kind of travel together, that saints influence saints influence saints. There was a saint who influenced John Bosco, and John Bosco influenced other people to become saints. And it's really beautiful. So I want you to think about what could it, what could I do so that my holiness can grow and I can set the people around me on fire. Not literally, please don't set them literally on fire. Set them on fire for love of God, you know? So think about that. Holiness spreads and it's amazing and it's incredible. So in the next video, we're going to be doing something that John Bosco practiced, and we're actually going to combine it with another prayer method from last week's Saint, Saint Ignatius of Loyola. Um, we're going to practice something called a Salesian Goodnight, and we're going to combine it with a new prayer of, by Saint Ignatius of Loyola called the Examine, which is a nighttime prayer. So that's what's on the menu for next time. Bye.